Welcome to the second in our series of Bible studies in which we search the scriptures to see whether same-sex relationships can be seen as acceptable in God's sight. In the first study, after some very important preliminary points, we looked at the Old Testament passages usually cited by the Conservative side. My conclusion is that while the Leviticus laws have some potentially corroborative value as evidence, there's no primary evidence in the Old Testament. Today, we go on to the New Testament. The Gospels clearly show that Jesus looked for a genuine holiness in uh, the life of his followers. But there's nothing that Jesus says that gives any indication, one way or the other, as to whether same-sex relationships can be part of such holy living. And the same is true of the Book of Acts. So we need to move to some crucial passages in St Paul's letters. We need to consider Romans 1, 16 to 32 and 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 to 11, together with one word from the latter passage repeated in 1 Timothy 1, 10. So first, Romans 1, um, actually you can start from verse 18, verses 18 to 32. This is an enormously significant passage for our discussion, so we will need to look at what Paul says in some detail. It will be therefore easier, I think, to follow if you have a Bible open in front of you. Let's listen to what this passage says. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder and strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but also to approve of those who practice them. Now in this part of Romans, Paul is arguing that all people are sinners and therefore in need of God's grace. 
And in these verses, he's dealing with the pagan world before going on a bit later on to deal with the situation of Jews. Paul begins the section by saying that the wrath of God is revealed against men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, for God's nature is clearly seen in what has been created. That's verses 18 to 20. He then begins to indicate the nature of the people he is talking about. They have turned, he says, from the immortal God to images, verses 21 to 23. In other words, they are idolaters. Therefore, he says, God has given them over to sinful desires and sexual impurity, since they've turned from the Creator to the created, verses 24 to 25. This has resulted in them acting out of lust. He sees this as resulting in homosexual activity, verses 26 to 27, and they are also involved in a whole variety of other sins and depravities, verses 28 to 32. Now, consider the description Paul gives of the people he is talking about. They have turned from the Creator to the created. They have been given over by God into what seems a sort of moral and spiritual vacuum, and they are acting out of lust and are involved in a whole host of sins. Does this describe the people we're talking about? Well, everybody's sinners, it fits to that degree, yes. But surely, as we think of the particular things Paul says, the answer has to be no. Many of the people we're considering are committed Christians who in no way have turned from the Creator to the created. They have not been handed over to a moral and spiritual vacuum, and indeed many of them show a great uh, quality of goodness, godliness and love in their lives. And they're not acting out of lust. They may have sexual desire, yes, but that is very different from lust. After all, think about a, a, a heterosexual couple coming to um, a clergyman for uh, marriage. You expect there to be sexual desire there, but that is different from lust. So then, Paul is describing here the pagan world with which he is surrounded. The description he gives of the people he's talking about is far removed from the people we're considering. So the question arises as to whether what he says about the people he is describing can be extended to the people we are considering. I think the answer to that is maybe yes, maybe no. Rather as in my crime illustration last week, maybe that was Boris Johnson the witness saw, or maybe it wasn't. But maybe yes, maybe no, does not constitute evidence. So this suggests that what Paul says here about the people he describes can only be seen as, at best, potentially corroborative evidence for the conservative case, nothing more. It does not describe the people we are talking about. Now you could pause here and look at this first section of what Paul says. That's uh, Romans 1, 18 to 25, reflecting on the description Paul gives of the people he has in mind and consider how it does or does not relate to the people we are thinking about. In this section from Romans 1, we obviously also need to look at the sins that Paul says are committed by the people he's describing, basically from verse 26 onwards. As well as the basic turning from the Creator to the created, we have what Paul describes as sexual impurity in verse 24, amplified in verses 26 to 27, in terms of what he describes as unnatural same-sex relationships. And then in verses 28 to 31, there's a whole list of other sinful actions and thoughts. Now, if we look at this list as objectively as we can, I am struck by the fact that some things that might appear obvious to us get no mention. So here is Paul writing to Rome, the centre of an empire that was based on slavery and only functioned because of slavery. For us today, we regard slavery 
whether we think about transatlantic, the transatlantic slave trade from past centuries or modern slavery, we think of it as utterly evil. But no mention here is made of this in what Paul writes. My conclusion from this would be that this is not a sort of objective, God-given list of sins, but rather the things that Paul was conscious of. In other words, there is an element of subjectivity, which doesn't mean that what Paul says is wrong, but it does mean we have to reflect carefully on his statements. The other thing that might strike us from Paul's list is the fact he gives such prominence to the homosexual sins he describes. They are the first thing he mentions, and the thing he gives far more attention to than anything else. Why? Are sexual sins worse than others? Surely not. Are same-sex sexual sins worse than any other sexual sins? Surely not. So it looks to me as though the attention that Paul gives to such sexual sins is at least partly a product of his own subjective assessment. Now here we need to think very carefully about Paul's description of the sexual relationships he's describing as being unnatural. That seems to me to be absolutely the key bit of this. Three times in verses 26 to 27, Paul uses the Greek words phusis and phusike, usually translated in our English translations as nature and natural. The conservative side generally takes natural to mean being in accord with God's creation, and often a linkage is suggested between Romans 1 and the creation stories of Genesis 1 and 2. And so, it is said, same-sex relationships being described by Paul as unnatural or not natural means they are contrary to God's creation purposes, and therefore wrong, objectively wrong. But if that's how we understand Paul, uh, understand what he's saying, then there are in fact four problems with this position. The first one is the issue of interpretation. What exactly does Paul mean by natural? Perhaps he does mean nature in some objective sense, and many conservative commentators um, will say that this echoes his starting point in the, this section, namely God's creation, and that therefore he's describing same-sex relationships as objectively unnatural and out of kilter with God's creation purposes. However, if we turn to 1 Corinthians 11 verses 14 to 15, we find that Paul uses the same word phusis about hair length in the NIV translation. Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? If we take Paul to be saying that objective nature teaches that it is disgraceful for a man to have long hair, then I think we have to conclude that he's plainly mistaken. Just think of many of the traditional pictures of Jesus portrayed with long hair. Think of some of the male monarchs that we've had in past centuries. Quite a number of them had long hair. Think of modern figures like, say, Billy Connolly, long hair. Whether or not you like the style, few of us would say it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair. And I guess none of us would say that objective nature teaches this. But that's what Paul seems to be saying. If you take him as, me, as Fuse's meaning objective nature. So he appears to be mistaken if we take that interpretation. And if he's mistaken here in using the term in 1 Corinthians about hair length, he can be equally mistaken in Romans 1 when he's talking about sexual relationships and we can place no reliance on what he says. But there is another way of looking at it. I think a better solution is to take it that when he speaks about hair length, he means not so much objective nature, but something more like personal instinctive reaction. 
and this would make sense. Few men in the Roman world of his day seem to have sported long hair. We might think of all those statues of Roman emperors with their neat, short-cut hair. It's therefore entirely reasonable that Paul would have a sort of gut reaction against men with long hair. And this would also make sense of something we've already noted, the rather extraordinary attention he gives in Romans 1 to same-sex relationships. There's this element of subjectivity about it. So perhaps then in Romans, when he uses these terms, phusis and phusike, he's saying more about his personal reaction to the idea of same-sex relationships rather than about something that is objectively and naturally, as we would use the word, right or wrong. And though we should take Paul's instinctive reaction seriously, since he was an apostle, uh, it hardly constitutes the primary evidence that is required for the conservative side. So that's the first problem with uh, understanding Paul to be saying something about objective nature. The second problem with the conservative side use of phusis here in Romans 1 is the practical issue. We frequently do what is not natural and do not consider it wrong. Taking it's a rather silly example, if you like. However hard I flap my arms, I can't fly. Flying is unnatural for me. But if I go and see my daughter in Thailand, I fly. I use the entirely unnatural means of an aircraft to fly. Something that is unnatural is not necessarily wrong. And you can think of other examples, many of them coming perhaps from medical science. Um, injections, blood transfusions, heart transplants are hardly natural. The third problem uh, with what Paul says is the logical philosophical issue. Philosophically, it is generally accepted that one cannot argue from an is statement, it is unnatural, to an ought statement, therefore it is wrong. That therefore is fallacious. There's a gap in the argument. For this argument to be valid, you have to insert some assumption along the lines of what is unnatural is wrong. But as in my last point, we've just seen that that assumption is in itself is mistaken. So there's a real problem here in the argumentation if we're taking Paul to mean uh, objective nature and therefore objectively wrong. And the last problem is the biological issue. Same-sex relationships, though the exception, are in fact natural, as is seen in the accounts we sometimes get of, for example, two male birds that form a bond and have even been cases where they've been known to hatch an egg with which they've been supplied and to raise a chick. And of course, same-sex attraction actually seems to be natural amongst human beings. Yes, it's, if you like, the exception, but it seems to be natural. So a series of problems with Paul's use of nature and natural, if we take him to mean something objective. And therefore I conclude that what we have here is something that has certainly an element of his own subjectivism in it, his own natural gut reaction to what he saw going on in the pagan world around him. Romans 1 is, of course, a hugely important passage for this debate. But as we look at the people Paul describes, and as we look at his description of the relationships he's talking about, there are such problems that we cannot see this passage as giving the primary evidence the conservative side needs. At best, it's only potentially corroborative evidence. Well, I would suggest another pause here. We've looked at a lot of detailed material. You might like to reread Romans 1, 18 to 32, and reflect again on what Paul says about the people he describes, and also on what implications we should or should not draw from what he says about the particular sins, uh, uh, or in particular the particular sexual actions that these people are involved in. Next, we turn to 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 11. Here we have in a list of various sins, that's verses 9 to 10, the two Greek words 
Malakoi and Arsenakoitai. The New International Version translates these words as men who have sex with men, and it adds a footnote. The words men who have sex with men translate two Greek words that refer to the passive and active participants in homosexual acts. So these words are generally taken to refer to aspects of homosexual behaviour, but because the first one basically means soft or effeminate, they perhaps fit better as a description of an unequal relationship in which the soft man is used by the active one, rather than the sort of relationship we're thinking about where we have two equal, equally consenting people involved in the relationship. But as well as questions about the exact shade of meaning here, it's important also to see the context in which these two words are used. In this passage in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is rebuking in very strong terms Christians who, instead of sorting out disagreements and disputes amongst themselves and, and sorting out by perhaps going to Christian leaders or whatever, they go to pagan judges. Look at verses 1 to 6. And this leads him to a biting description of the sinful nature of the sort of people, such as those pagan judges, that these, Christian, these Christians are turning to. That's verses 9 to 11. So he's clearly referring here to basically the same people he talked about in Romans 1. In other words, a fair enough description of pagan society then, and maybe perhaps also in our own day, but in no way a description of the people we're talking about. Now we may well see in Paul's use of these two words his dislike of same-sex relationships. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But as with Romans 1, the crucial issue is whether what he says about the undoubted evils of the pagan world, he, uh, whether that gives real grounds, real evidence for the conservative case that seeks to condemn the behaviour of gay people who are, in fact, far removed in behaviour from those wicked people described in verses 9 to 10. Again, I would agree those words, these words in 1 Corinthians 6, can be seen as a potentially corroborative evidence in that, yes, they do refer to um, same-sex relationships in a negative way, but we have to face the questions about whom this passage is speaking, and as with Romans 1, I think this means that it can be no more than potentially corroborative evidence. We're still looking for any primary evidence. Finally, in Paul's writings, there's 1, T 1 Timothy 1.10. In a list of sins, we again find the word arsenokoitai. However, we have no context here for the use of this word, and so the most natural thing is to assume the context is much as in Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 6, i.e. he's talking about the pagan world, not about the sort of people that we have in mind. One other New Testament verse needs comment, and that is Jude chapter 1, verse 7. This passage refers to Sodom and Gomorrah, and presumably has in mind the episode in Genesis 19 that we were thinking about last time. Both sides can agree that what is described in that episode is perverted and sinful, since it is about intended gang rape. But just as the original Genesis passage does nothing to show that the perversion lay in the fact that it involved same-sex rape, so the passage in Jude does not help us in deciding whether the perversity lay in it being rape or in it being same-sex. So that passage really doesn't get us any further forward. So while all these passages and verses are of course consistent with the conservative view, they're shot through with questions, which mean that in my view they cannot supply the strong primary evidence needed to declare same-sex relationships to be always wrong and to demand that those who cannot sustain a heterosexual relationship should be celibate. 
Last time we saw that this was true of the Old Testament passages, and today we see the same is true of the relevant New Testament passages. A final pause here. Look at and think at about the three passages I've just mentioned. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 11, 1 Timothy 1, 10, and Jude 1, verse 7. Next time, we shall go on to consider the other side. We shall go on to consider the question, are there any biblical arguments that suggest same-sex relationships can be right? Let's end this session with prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, your word that touches on so many important issues. Help us as we seek to understand what is said in the New Testament. Help us as we look at these important passages to see and discern the truth. Help us to be faithful to your word, ready to hold on to what has been believed in the past where that is right, but equally ready to embrace new truth where that is right. Lead us, we pray, lead your church to truly know and follow your will. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.